Thank you for joining me for this tutorial discussion of Vimbans and Viti. And what I thought we'd start by doing is just ask you to introduce yourselves to the audience. So, San Viti, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Sanviti. I'm, I'm uh, SP3, uh, currently working in Romsey. Thank you very much. And Vimbai? Thank you, Prof. Uh, my name is Vimbai Duncan. I'm recently qualified just last month and I'm working in East Kent in Dover. Fantastic. That's really good news. Thank you very much. And I'm Michael Harris. I've worked as a GP for 30 years and I've got a particular interest in teaching about primary care research. Vimban Savidi, I sent you a paper called Understanding the Patient's Experience of Celiac Disease Diagnosis, and it's a qualitative research study. Vimbai, can you summarise what the research was about and why they did it? The research that you sent us, uh, Prof, was a paper from the British Journal of General Practitioners, which was a qualitative interview that was designed to understand the patient's experience of being diagnosed with celiac disease. Now, classically, celiac disease presents with uh, steatoria, diarrhea, sometimes loss of weight, but then you can also have non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, anemia, and it can present at any age with a variety of symptoms. So sometimes this results in a delay in diagnosis, which can have a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. It can also affect them in terms of long-term consequences such as osteoporosis and cancer. So traditionally, a diagnosis of a celiac disease was done via a two-step pathway where a patient would get a serological testing and then an endoscopy whilst on a gluten-containing diet. However, uh, the British Society of Gastroenterology recently, I think around 2020, changed the guidelines and they've said uh, a serological testing is sufficient to diagnose a patient with celiac disease. Um, especially if they have no alarm symptoms. So this uh, study was done to show uh, diagnostic experience of patients with celiac disease. And the researchers therefore aim to identify and understand the patient's pathway to diagnosis and how it might be improved and also just get their perspective on how they feel whilst waiting for diagnosis. Thanks very much, Vimbai. You've explained that beautifully. And Samviti. Does this research really matter to us? Is it relevant to us as GPs? Yes, uh, I believe it is quite important in primary care because it's looking into patient experiences and how they felt about uh, the process in being diagnosed with celiac disease. So I do think it can have an impact on our day-to-day -day practice and how we can improve patient satisfaction. Thanks, Sambiti. I think you're exactly right. Now, the authors, Sambiti, they did qualitative research. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means? Sure. So if we were to compare it with quantitative, it's the opposite. So it's looking at essentially collecting data and analysing a non-numerical information. And it's essentially to again, how patients, what their experiences are like, so why they do what they do and how they think in certain circumstances. Thank you very much, Sanvidi. Vimbai, they used a quantitative research method called thematic analysis. What is that and how is it done? So from my understanding of thematic analysis, it's, it's uh, a type of qualitative research that's mainly used in primary care and what it does is it sort of gives researchers a structured approach to organizing and interpreting their data so they do this using different methods so you can use focus group discussions interviews just to understand the perspective and the knowledge and ideas that patients have concerning certain things So in a thematic analysis, it's a six-stage process. So first of all, the researchers need to familiarize themselves with the data that they've collected. So 
either through reading through the interviews or the transcriptions from the interviews. Then after that, they code the information that they've gotten from the first stage. Then after that, they look for common themes around the question that they're asking. So that's, I think it's called theme generation, where they're sort of generating the theme. Then they need to review that theme. So they look at other researchers who have looked at the same information. Then they have to write up a narrative for all of us to have a look. Thank you very much, Vimbai. And Sanviti, how did they actually do that process in this study? They recruited interviewees who had done a survey in regards to being diagnosed with celiac disease in the past. They then um, essentially interviewed them. So they did a semi-structured sort of interview in which the researcher asked questions to try and cover all the areas that they wanted to, but equally asked open-ended questions to give flexibility to the participants. So that... Bimbai, what sort of sampling methods do you know for qualitative research? For qualitative research, we do what we call purposive sampling, where you're looking at a defined characteristic already in, in, in the participants. We've got something that we call convenient sampling. In convenient sampling, we're looking at people who've got the characteristics that we're looking for, but they're easily accessible. We can also do something that's called stratified sampling, where you're looking at different groups, for example, male or female. There's also something that's called maximum variation sampling, where you're sort of looking at picking uh, participants are across different social cultural backgrounds so that you get a mix of feel of um, people across different backgrounds. The other one is snowball sampling. This one is where you're sort of asking participants who are already in the study to refer other patients or people that they know who may be interested in the study. And snowball sampling is particularly useful in what we call hard to reach populations, where we use the participants to help us recruit future participants. So if we Sanbiti, what are the risks of bias in qualitative research and how did the researchers try to reduce those risks? So because in qualitative research, it's based on the judgment and experience of the researchers, the analysis is subjective, quite unique to the researcher. So there are various ways that the researchers can try and reduce their risk of bias. Which ones did the researchers use in this study? They try to use more than one person to not only transcribe the data, but then also code it. Finbe, did you spot any other things that they did to try to reduce the risk of bias? Yes. So just to add on to what Samita is saying, things like um, confirmation bias, where you're yeah, sort of worried that the researcher interprets the data in the way that they want. So sometimes they actually have to state that conflict of interest or their background. And I think it's called reflexivity, where they mention what their background is so that it's out, up, out there in the public for us to understand on our own what kind of bias this the research could be subjective to. There's also something that's called social desirability bias, where you are worried that the participants are worried about being judged, so they're going to give answers that they think we want to hear so we need to be quite careful in terms of how we interview the participants, how we structure the question so that they don't feel judged and they give us straight answers. And one of the other ways that can reduce this bias is by actually bringing back the results to the participants for them to review them and to give us an idea of whether they think that is correct or not. But I wanted to just ask about triangulation because I didn't really get how that works, if that's okay. Okay, so... Triangulation is where the researchers use more than one method to answer the research question, to see whether each method supports the results of the other methods. So they could, for example, some researchers could do semi-structured interviews and also do some questionnaires with open-ended questions and compare the results of those two and see how much overlap there is. And if there's a lot of overlap between the two, then that gives evidence that their findings are probably valid. Samvita, the authors talked about data saturation. What does that mean and why is that important? Data saturation, in this particular research paper, essentially the researcher would ask questions 
until they weren't getting any new information. So researchers will keep interviewing usually until there are no new ideas, no new themes coming through from the interviews. So there's no point in continuing with to do yet more interviews. So that's called data saturation. And usually at that point, they stop interviewing. Bimbai, what were the study's main findings? The study's main findings were that patients described experiencing uncertainty during the diagnostic process for celiac disease. So uh, before diagnosis, the interview is presented with non-specific symptoms. And some, subject, some of the symptoms were sometimes present for many years. So they became normal for the interviewees and or they attributed them to an alternative diagnosis. And in many cases in general practice, it's either uh, irritable bowel syndrome or anemia. And so during the investigations as well, half of the interviewees were unaware that their serology test included the test for celiac disease, and some actually reported being shocked when they were told that they tested positive for celiac disease when they didn't even know that it was in the doctor's mind to, to, to diagnose that. Thanks, Zimbai. And Sanviti, should we make any changes in our practice as a result of this study? I think it depends on the clinician at the end of the day, but equally, I think maybe having a shared approach with the patient might be of benefit. I think giving all the relevant information could be could be useful to essentially improve patient satisfaction. But I think ultimately it depends on the clinician and I think with that they need to consider the resources, so the time, the skills especially. Thank you so much for discussing this paper with me. Thank you.